Hello, advanced human beings. Welcome back to the channel. We're starting off today's video lesson with a flashback question from the 2020 HSC exam. Question is, which inequality gives the domain of y equals square root of 2x minus 3? By all means, pause the video and figure out which of the four options you would be going for. Okay, so to answer this question correctly, all we really need to know, um, so we're thinking about domain, which is the x values that we can substitute into our function and get uh, real answers. So for this question, because we have 2x minus 3 inside of a square root, if we're substituting in values of x, we need to make sure that 2x minus 3 is not negative. Okay, we cannot do the square root of a negative number. So we're going to start off by saying 2x minus 3 needs to be 0 or larger. Okay, that's the key to this question. And now we just solve this inequality by adding the three across and then dividing by two. And we have our correct answer of x equals, oh sorry, x is greater than or equal to three over two, which is option D. Well done if that was the one that you picked. Okay, in today's video, we are starting off a new topic for the channel. We are looking at um, a U11 advanced topic called discrete probability functions. Today's lesson is just on an introduction to what they are and some types of questions you're going to encounter. Okay, to start off, we need to talk about two different types of random variables that we're going to explore in this course. We're looking at discrete random variables today. Later on in year 12, we're going to look more closely at continuous random variables. Now, some examples of some random variables which are continuous. Um, a few examples for you could be measuring rainfall, um, measuring someone's height, or measuring the speed of a car. In all three of these examples, these are types of data that we obtain by measuring. Okay? So to make things easy, I'm gonna say that continuous variables are things that we obtain by measurement. Whereas discrete random variables, to give you some examples, um, number of cars in a car park would be a discrete variable. Another one would be how many students we have in a class. And the third example could be the outcome of a dice roll. Um, and for an example, we know the outcome of a dice roll, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the reason these variables are discrete is because we are not gonna measure these variables. We're really gonna be counting. You're not gonna measure how many cars there are in a car park or how many students are in a class. You obtain these answers by counting. Okay, so one of the key differences between continuous and discrete data is that discrete is typically gonna be whole numbers or there's gonna be gaps between your variable points. For example, if you said there was 25 students in the class and you said, what's the next um, largest data point? I would say, well, the next largest is 26. If you told me your height was 180 centimeters and you said, what's the next height? Well, I can't say 181 centimeters because really it could be 180.000001 centimeters, okay? So in a measurement system, there's no gaps between our variables, so it's called a continuous measurement system. Whereas in discrete, there are gaps and typically we're gonna be counting. All right, so to make it simple, I just think discrete, counting, continuous is measuring. All right, up next, we're gonna look at what a probability function is here. So I've got an example for you. Um, I've recorded the data on the number of behavior referrals for 15 students in my class. So we have zero referrals happened seven times. So there were seven students who had no referrals because they are um, good students. We had five students who had one referral, two students had two referrals, and one student had three referrals. Pity. Okay, now we can express this um, using what's called a probability distribution table where we have our outcomes, which we're gonna represent by X. And then underneath our outcomes, we're going to have the probability of that outcome occurring, which we're gonna notate as probability of capital X equal to lowercase x. All right, so we have 15 students in the class and seven of those students had no referrals. So if you picked a student random from this class, the probability they would have no referrals would be seven out of 15. So under zero, we're gonna write seven out of 15 as our probability. Five out of the 15 had one referral, so we're gonna write a third for one because that's the simplified version of five out of 15. For two, we had two students out of 15 as our answer. And we had one student out of 15 having three referrals, so our probability is one out of 15. Okay, so here is what's called a probability distribution table. Outcomes across the top, probabilities across the bottom. All right, so now we're gonna talk about what's called a probability distribution function, which is a special type of probability table from before. So for a table to have a probability distribution function, this is just some definitions. 
uh, all our outcomes need to be mutually exclusive. Okay, that means that you can't be in two of the outcomes at once. Similar to a dice roll, you can't roll a two and a three on one roll, so all the outcomes are mutually exclusive, and that's the criteria for today. Other important factor is that um, the sum of all the probabilities in your function need to add up to one, so you have a completed sample space. Okay, if you don't have an entire sample space of one, we are not gonna qual qualify as a probability distribution function. Um, another bit of lingo is that if all your probabilities are the same value, like with a dice roll, where we have six outcomes, all with a probability of one in six, we refer to those, uh, those functions as uniform. Okay, but these are pretty rare because they're pretty boring. All right, let's get into an example to get more comfortable with the idea of these functions and the kind of stuff we can do with them. So here we have a probability function um, notated by P of X. And this is being defined for three outcomes, three, four, and five. Okay, so if you sub in three, four, or five into your function, it's gonna give you the probability of that outcome occurring. So we're gonna translate this from a probability function into a probability distribution table. So we're gonna need a bit of space. Like before, we're gonna do a table with two rows. Across the top is gonna to be our outcomes, and across the bottom is gonna be the probability of those outcomes occurring, which we can obtain from our function. Okay, if we substituted three into our function, into this equation here, we would have three minus two is one, one over six is our probability. If we substituted four into the function, so we did P of four, we'd have four minus two is two, two out of six is one out of three. And for five, five minus two is three, so we can have three out of six, AKA one out of two. Okay, so right there is our probability distribution table. We have three distinct outcomes, so they are mutually exclusive. And if we added up our three probabilities, we would get an answer of one. That's what we need to do for part B. So part B is show that this table here is a probability distribution function. Uh, quite clearly, we have three distinct outcomes. So like I said, they are mutually exclusive. The other criteria we need to quickly check is that if we added up the probabilities, one sixth plus one third plus one half is indeed equal to one. So it meets the criteria and we can say that P of X is a probability distribution function. Already getting sick of saying those three words. All right. Up next, uh, we are gonna do part C and part D. So part C is find the probability of an outcome uh, being greater than four. So if we look at our table, we have three outcomes and only one of them is greater than four, it's the five. And the probability of a five occurring is one out of two. So there is the probability of our outcome being greater than four. Same thing as the probability of five. For part D, we wanna find the probability of our outcome being between, um, so X is greater than three, but less than or equal to five. So we're between three and five, we're excluding three, but we are including five. So if we exclude three, we're gonna be including the four and we're gonna include the five. So we have a one third chance of four, a one half chance of five. If we add those two together, cause we're saying we could be, could have four or five, we get a total answer of five out of six for our probability. Okay, on to example two, we have another table um, where we have across the top is, um, so the number of uh, the number of traffic lights stopped at on the way to work. Okay, so there's three traffic lights between Jamie and his work. He can stop at zero red lights, one, two, or three red lights. Probabilities are across the bottom. Okay, first part of the question is what is the value of Y from the table? Okay, well, let's think. Because we know this is a probability distribution function, again, uh, we know that the sum of the probabilities needs to be a complete sample space of one. So we can say 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 plus Y plus 0 0.4 is equal to one. If we solve this for Y, we'll get that Y is equal to 0 0.3. So there is a 30% chance that Jamie is stopped by two red lights on his way to work. Okay, part B is asking for the mode of X. So you are probably familiar with mode from statistics in junior school. We know the mode is the, uh, the most frequent outcome. So we're gonna apply this to probability and say the mode is the most likely outcome. So we have a 10% chance of zero, 20% chance of one, 30% of two, but a 40% chance of being stopped by three red lights. So because three has the highest probability, it's the most likely and thus it's our mode. 
For part C, for our median, uh, the median is the outcome which crosses over the boundary of 50% in ascending order. What I mean by that, starting at zero, we have 10% chance. If we include the one, now we have a 30% chance. If we add on the two, and remember the value of y is 30% or 0.3. If we add on the 0.3, we're now up to 60%. Okay, so the crossover between 50 and 51% happened in the two, so that is our median value. Okay, it's the number where the half chance occurs if you're adding them on as you go, essentially. Okay, and part D is the tricky part. Jamie drives to work on two consecutive days. What is the probability he stops at the same number of traffic lights on both days? All right, so the way we're gonna approach this is we're saying we wanna find the probability of getting zero on both days, or we could have stopping at one light on both days, or we could have two or three. So our approach looks like this. Probability of same on both days could be zero, zero, or one, one, two, two, or three, three. If you've studied probability or maybe watched my probability videos, you know that um, the chances of doing two things repeated is going to be the multiplication of the probabilities. What I mean by that is we have a 0.1 chance of being stopped by zero red lights and a 0.1 chance of being stopped on the second day. The chances of those both happening concurrently, one after the other, is going to be 0.1 multiplied by 0.1. So we're gonna calculate these four probabilities. We could have any of them. So we're saying this or this or this or this, which means we're going to sum them all together to get a total answer. So for zero, zero, we're gonna do 0 0.1 times 0 0.1. For one, one, we're gonna take the probability of 0 0.2 and multiply it by itself. So on and so forth. If we add these values all together, we get a probability of 30% or 0 0.3. So there's a 0.3 chance that he is stopping at the same number of traffic lights on both days that he drives to work. Okay, on to example three, we have we are trying to find the value of k in this probability function p of x, uh, where p of x is equal to k times x plus one. So our variables or our outcomes x are ranging from one to four, and it is a discrete probability function. Okay, so for this one, we're going to substitute in our four values of one, two, three, and four to get um, our expressions for the four probabilities of these outcomes occurring. Okay, so to start off with, when x is one, p of one is equal to k times one plus one. It's like it's k times two, which we'll write as two k. Okay, so the outcome of one has a probability of two k. If we repeat this process for two, we're gonna get three k, 3 gets us 4k, and then k times 4 plus 1 gets us 5k. All right, now the reason I've done this is because we know that p of x is a discrete probability function, we know that the sum of the probabilities has to, of course, be equal to 1, as we saw before. So we can say 2k plus 3k plus 4k plus 5k is going to be equal to 1, and now we can solve this equation for k. On the left-hand side, we get 14k, uh, we'll divide both sides by 14, and we end up with our solution, k is equal to 1 over 14. Okay, and to finish off with a challenge question, we have a discrete random variable x has the following probability distribution function, or just probability distribution. Find the value of p. Okay, so what have we already explored about the um, outcomes of a discrete probability distribution? As we've already mentioned a few times in this video, if we sum together all the probabilities, we should get a complete sample space equal to one. All right, that's the technique we're gonna apply for this question as well. Once again, we have four outcomes with four probabilities. They're in terms of P, but we're going to add the four probabilities together, set it equal to one, and we'll have an equation that we can try and solve. So we have P squared plus P squared plus P over four plus four P, four P plus one over eight equal to one. And now our goal is to solve this equation. All right, whenever I have fractions involved in my equation, um, typically the sooner you can get rid of your fractions, the more simple the equation will be. So I'm looking at the four and the eight, and I'm saying, what's a number that four and eight both multiply into? And a good answer is eight. So what I'm now gonna do is take all five pieces of this equation, so everything separated by a plus and a minus, and I'm going to multiply by eight. So we have eight p squared, eight p squared, 8p over 4, 
and multiplying this fraction by eight is gonna cancel with the denominator of eight and leave us with four P plus one. Right hand side, one times eight is of course eight. Okay, now eight P divided by four is gonna be two P. So we're gonna have eight P squared plus eight P squared is 16 P squared. If we simplify even further, we get um, 16 P squared plus six P. We're gonna subtract the eight from both sides. So we have minus seven on the left equal to zero. Reason I did that is because we are solving a quadratic equation and you always wanna have your quadratic equations equal to zero before you solve them if you wanna get the right answer. Okay, now we're trying to solve this. Um, it is factorizable if you're very brave, but I'm guessing most students would probably reach towards the quadratic equation, which is of course fine. So here's our quadratic formula. We have negative b at the front plus minus b squared. So remember a is 16, b is six and c is minus seven. So b squared minus four times 16 times minus seven, all over two times 16. If we simplify inside our square root, we get 484 um, and on the bottom we get 32. Square root of 484 is conveniently equal to 22. So we're gonna get some um, actual answers, actual rational answers. Uh, if we get our two answers, one of them is a half and the other answer is going to be negative. So we don't actually care about it because remember, P is in our table, it is a probability. And probabilities cannot be negative. They are always between zero and one. So even though our plus minus in our quadratic formula gets us two answers, a positive and a negative, we only care about the positive one, which is one half, because probabilities must be greater than zero. If you tried that by yourself and got the same answer, congratulations on getting this challenge question correct. Okay, here are some assigned exercises for my class. For everybody else, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.